the islands of Arabia. 500 Yes Music Podcasts. We are delighted to welcome Ivan Novello award-winning composer and arranger Paul K. Joyce, who recently orchestrated selected songs on The Quest and is extremely well known, at least in my household, for a certain million-plus selling hit single, which he created back in 2001, and perhaps we'll ask him about that in a moment. So, <laughs> welcome, Paul. Well, hello, and very nice to be here. OK, so let's delve right back into your earliest musical memories. And what was the first sort of experience that you remember of, of music in your household or somewhere else? Strangely enough, um, I remember at school I went to um, a Tangerine Dream concert. Uh, I grew up Goodness in the UK, a small, yeah, a small <laughs> uh, UK city called Nottingham. And uh, I went to see Tangerine Dream. And midway through the concert, I had this incredible feeling as the music surged through the hall that this is what I wanted to do with with my life. Uh, oh. It was an amazing feeling. Uh, and, you know, I like Tangerine Dream, but it was the live experience that really moved me. That actually might uh, partially answer my question for you, Paul, and that is uh, you didn't do music at university. So what no. made you go from biology to music? Was there a moment that caused it? Was it the Tangerine Dream situation? <laughs> I had been studying piano and uh, piano was a really, really big thing in my life. But it, I don't know it's the, whether it's the same with all composers, but I was noodling around at the piano and it's the only word I can think of and um, I, I started writing short pieces of music which I eventually put into one larger piece of music and uh, as all teenagers or often mu musical teenagers I was in a, a band that doing covers and playing the clubs around wh where I grew up oh. and I tried to get my fellow musicians to uh, play this piece of music and it didn't work out so basically aged 18 hmm. I played all the instruments myself hired a studio and recorded a, a 20 minute of course uh, <laughs> piece of music uh, it had to be 20 minutes and uh, that thereby beginning my co recording career that's fantastic. Now, you went on, did you not, to be a member of a synth pop trio called Sense in the 1980s. And you released singles and, and an album. And I listened to, to some of that music that you did back then. And mm. I thought it reminded me a bit of Howard Jones' Soft Cell or, or that kind of thing. So exactly. how did you get from that kind of music to be just to physically be a, a, able to arrange full orchestra? I, I bought a synthesizer. I mean, it was that simple. And the synthesizer sort of lent itself to playing those particular rhythms and sounds of the time. Mm. And I, I, I do like rhythmic music, I think, which reached its classical exposition uh, when I attended a Steve Reich concert, again oh. in Nottingham. And my whole life changed. I think that must have been a, in about 19... 85 or something like that it, it literally changed my life and suddenly classical music and rock and roll uh, and, and all those rhythmic and repetitive elements uh, seem to make sense but in, in answer to your question uh, it, I don't know I, I, I just enjoyed that uh, melody and I was very much you know I was 22 and very much interested in the sounds of the time and in fact, we were discovered by the keyboard player from Soft Cell, and mm. he produced mm. uh, produced the album, and we did tour, um, you know, with Depeche Mode and uh, Kim yeah. Wilde throughout Europe. So we had we had a great time. Unbelievable. So synth pop was perhaps somewhat of a reaction against the excesses of the 1970s prog rock. But were you ever a fan of prog, and were you ever a fan of Yes? Wow. <laughs> There's a question. <laughs> uh, after my e epiphany at uh, the Tangerine Dream concert, uh, I then, aged 14, uh, was handed a copy of Close to the Edge in the sixth form common room. <laughs> and I thought, what is this sort of jazzy, <laughs> classically, being into Alice Cooper, T-Rex and Bowie, it was a new thing for uh, me. Yeah. So anyway, I was persuaded to go to a concert at, uh, of theirs. And uh, needless to say, uh, I, I loved it. And yes, I was a big fan of Yes 
right from the age of 15 onwards. And I would say there's, they remain, for me, one of the most joyful, exuberant bands in the world in that, you know, I've listened to lots of music, but there is something about the combination of uh, musical competency, but extraordinary uh, compositional ability uh, as well. And mm. coupled with John Anderson's lyrics, they seem to allude to things rather than spell things out, which I particularly enjoy. So mm. they have that poetic quality. So, yes, I, I, I'm an enormous uh, Yes fan. So uh, not, not that I want to uh, preempt anything you're about to say, but so you can imagine... When Steve Howe contacted me uh, yes. later on in my life, it was a, a bit of a moment. Yes, indeed. So <laughs> just, just on that then with Yes, what, what was the band doing when you first discovered them? So you, you got close to the edge, but that was presumably significantly that, yes. after that. So what it, were they actually doing at the time you first got into it them? It was and, and topographic and relayer. Because I, ah, I remember, right. I remember uh, in Christmas 1973... I knew I was getting topographic oceans for Christmas, so I snuck into my mum's bedroom, unwrapped it, <laughs> listened to it, wrapped it up again. I did that several times before Christmas, <laughs> Christmas arrived. Wow. <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, and I loved, um, I loved the experimental... Just, uh, for me, they seemed to embody everything that was... was um, positive about rock bands of course they were about to face uh, punk music so mm. uh, th th they had a, a tricky time there I don't think it affected their worldwide ability to pull crowds or, or sell records but you know it was a changed landscape then yeah absolutely uh, so what did you think of Tales when you heard it then and and also what did you think of Relay because those are two very different um, yeah, records um, aren't they if I'm being really honest I think Topographic would have been better as a two-sided disc. Oh, I agree. Personally, with Ritual more or less in its current state, which I think the end, the end of the whole piece is the most extraordinary uh, build-up to that. Yeah. You know, the, the chord changes are mm. just uh, incredible. But I think there was a lot of, compared to Close to the Edge and its carefully orchestrated quality, I think it, it felt to me like there was a lot of filler in there. And I thought they were capable of, I don't know, side three, there could have been a smattering of that because I love the raucous yeah. dissonance of it. And then getting back to your relay question, I, I loved Sound Chaser. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sound Chaser and the solo in To Be Over, which I think is probably ah. Steve Howe's greatest achievement, I would say. Let's just take a, a bit of a sidestep then at the, for a moment from Yes. We'll come back to Yes in a moment. Along the way, then, on your, your career path, uh, which has a slightly interesting trajectory, doesn't it? You, <laughs> I'm glad you, you said that. You, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you ended up writing some of the most recognisable UK TV, children's TV themes uh, of all time, as well as soundtrack music for, for children's television. How on earth did that come about? Uh, it's a needs-must situation in some respects, because... You don't want to have to go back and uh, the band didn't work out that I was in the, the synth pop band. Mm. And I stepped sideways, I suppose. And without realising it, I pursued a path that was offered to me, but I didn't think I would enjoy, which was a it was a, to an animated television series with a, a British actor called Richard Briers. Oh, yes. Called Coconuts. And I loved it. I mean, I really loved it because it gave me the chance to do lots of different kinds of music, get really into arranging, mm. uh, and I'm, the director was excellent. And with it gave me... Um, I, I, I'd become very, well, jaded and uh, cynical about the uh, recording business that mm. I didn't think, again, with punk around and everything, I just didn't think I had a, a place really doing what I, I want to do. Um, oh. So anyway, I had the, with this new burst of confidence, I approached the BBC and asked them if there were any other animated series ah. that uh, were pending. And um, 
I pitched for, as you always pitch for something. People very rarely commissioned you <laughs> directly. And I pitched for the BBC's new uh, Noddy series, which was their flagship series. Mm. Mm. And I got the job. And, and yeah. that sort of was the beginning. And one job, as, as always, leads to another. And before yeah. I knew it, I was headlong into this uh, new, new direction. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, it's fantastic, and of course, the the award-winning and um, and million-selling uh, record I was alluding to at the top was was the, the theme tune to Bob the Builder, which is which uh, honestly, there's a, such a soft soft place in my heart for that that music, and my children grew up watching that particular animated series, and it's it's such fun. W- was that a huge amount of fun to do as well? Honestly, I mean. A, a wonderful the, the producers that crafted it because you know in all these they're they're commercial enterprises but be, behind the scenes the, the the artists the animators the there are people who are really really dedicated to creating something that of you know of value and, and longevity mm. Mm. and uh, so yeah it was great fun doing it and you know, I, I couldn't think of anything to rhyme with builder so I split up <laughs> the catchphrase into a you know what I felt was a, 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 a more memorable form. Yes. And before you know it, I mean, I, I think you never know with songs which ones are going to become uh, popular. But yes. uh, I think I, when I was going through the streets of Nottingham one evening, these these lads were you know coming out of the pub and they were singing it, <laughs> and I thought, wow, what, what's going on? Why are they singing a, a children's yeah. TV you know, uh, yes. theme? Yes. Yes. Yeah, it was you, weird. You, you, you know, before I get on to the next question, I got to say, though, I was very fascinated about this whole television themes and soundtrack stuff, because in here in North America, me being a musician myself, one of mm. the hardest avenues to get into is soundtrack and TV music and video game music, especially. Mm. Uh, it is, But it is well known that it's also probably one of the best paying ends of the music uh, genre there, but I, I was I just found it fascinating just how you answered that that it was just simply a matter of you you know inquiring about doing it and then they you know allowed you to do it because over here it's very much a who you know and who is back you kind oh. of pat on the back to get into this because it's very very closed off sort of thing here in North America so I just found it very interesting that that end of it over on your side of the the pond there. When I think back to it, the, 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 it was a woman at the BBC who, who really held sway over the children's department. And so she could decide, you know, just her, um, who did what, really. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, she, she didn't give me the job. I, I, had to, I did a blind pitch, you know, and I met the creators of the series. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, if, if you know the parameters if you know what they need and you have the capacity to to deliver it for for me uh, it it was a gr- a great job that first that first noddy job <laughs> absolutely <laughs> okay so let, let's let's move on over to steve howe now so you've been involved in some amazing musical events how did you meet steve howe and get involved with his time album well, in the UK, there's the Performing Rights Society, um, which collects royalties on behalf of musicians, performing mm-hmm. royalties on behalf of yes. musicians. They had a, a magazine that uh, I contributed to in the form of an article. And I said in this article that uh, I worshipped Yes. <laughs> and Steve read the article. And because it was in relation to... Uh, a project that I'd done called the Snow Queen, where mm. I'd in, you know I, I'd got some pretty big players involved: the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and Juliet Stevenson, and, and the BBC had made a film of it. Mm. I think he must have taken note. Anyway, I, I'd moved house from the the middle of the country to the far west of the, of, of the UK in to Cornwall, mm. and uh, he he tracked me down. <laughs> he sent a letter to my old address in Nottingham. They forwarded it on to uh, my new address. And, well, I, I mean, they say never meet your heroes. But uh, in, in Steve's case, it's proved to be the most amazing exception. Oh, uh, oh. He's, well, you know, without being too over the top, uh, he's an absolute pleasure to know and, and to work with. 
Absolutely. Well, the, the music on that, that album, and to be honest, it's the first time when we knew we were going to speak to you, it's the first time I've listened to that album properly. Time. It, it's, mm-hmm. Yes, time. It's absolutely beautiful. With Thank classical, you. Classical arrangements as well as, as Steve Howe compositions. And I noticed that you are credited by Steve with being a, a sort of full collaborator on the record rather than just coming in and doing, doing arrangements. So how did you work uh, on that record with Steve and did you find it um, easy? Yes, I, I did. Uh, basically, the coincidence, the big coincidence, was that I'd moved to within uh, an hour of where mm. Steve lives uh, mm. Mm. as he has a, a home in, in Devon yeah. uh, the, where, where Yes used to rehearse. And we'd have this happy exchange where he'd come over to me, I'd go over to him... I'd do demos, I'd send them off to him and we'd have lunch and it, it, it was, we, we took our time over it, no pun intended. And um, <laughs> it just, uh, until we were ready and it was just a really, really happy and a happy process, really. And, and actually links back to a question uh, I asked a little earlier and that's, you know, here you are with classical arrangements this time. And did you sort of cut your teeth in terms of writing for instruments with some of the earlier things like the, the soundtrack work? And then you could bring it into a full sort of classical uh, arrangement with this album. Or, or did you did you go on courses or how did you get to to be able to to arrange for orchestra? Slowly. <laughs> and, I learned, and I learned on my feet. Um, you, you're right. Uh, Kevin, it was um, it's that thing of uh, because computers allowed you to build up arrangements, I I sort of learned that when and where to use things and, uh, you know, just the the art of production, I suppose. Uh, Mm. But when I was involved in some of my TV projects, one particular project, which was a a Montreal uh, UK co-production with Gala Films in Montreal. There's a big Canada connection here, Mark, Mark, by the way. (laughs) Basically, uh, we used a a small orchestra to Mm. augment the the cues. I mean, every time there was a possibility of a a bigger budget, the instruments, you know, were uh, as real as we could get them rather than Mm. using samples. Mm. Yeah. And um, my manager uh, also played a huge part because he was a, a cello player with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, or had been, and so he introduced me to the, you know, the, the sort of creme de la creme of ses- session players in the UK, mm. and it just began. I learned then the art of scoring. My first uh, score that I presented to classical players was a disaster because mm. I just printed off the notes and I said, "Well, here it is," and they they played it as they saw it. There were no expression marks, nothing. I said, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa stop." You know, it's quiet there. It's loud. We said, well, you need to put that on the page then. And so I learned a big, big lesson. Um, and so it, it's a slow process and you learn because to have an orchestra at your disposal, it's a big, it's a big thing. And you, the, the temptation is that everybody plays at the same time. And mm. I think the thing you learn is that, you know, less can be, more. Mm. I hate talking in cliches, but it's um, it's, a, it's a useful thing to learn. E- economy, I suppose. Yeah. So this question I've been excited to ask you about because this is something that I've been thinking about for most of my musical life ever since I got into you know into listening to orchestra stuff. So this might be a little nerdy, so bear with me. Okay. Um, I've always wondered how a composer selects the instruments in an orchestra. For example. Why have five violin players and not eight? Or why do you have four cello players and not two? You know what I mean? Like, uh, and also, is there a certain type of musical piece that doesn't require brass instruments? Yeah, yes, there, yes, there are. Um, with regard to size, for instance, in the time recordings, it was a, a, a very compact band. It was essentially a, a, a string quintet um, with uh, vibes, clarinets, harp, and, and those forces, they don't suggest uh, bombast. I think that that's probably mm-hmm. the best way to put it. That it, it, it provides an intimacy, intimacy of sound. If you, for the sessions for, for the quest, 
I was keen that we, for instance, didn't use any symbols or percussion in the the sections Mm -hmm. I was involved in, Mm. uh, so that you didn't get that feeling that the orchestra was in any way competing with the band. Mm. And and you you had a sense of an orchestral event, but not this... There's a tendency to to make things too bombastic in my... Mm. I've used that word twice now, but um, Mm. Mm. that, that would be my feeling. So to have a large, large forces... You have a sense of obviously scale, but there's a certain anonymity to it as well. The smaller the band, the more you can hear the individual players, and you get this feeling of intimacy and and warmth. I hope yeah. I don't know whether that answers your question. Uh, oh no, but, that's that, that's fine. That's absolutely yeah. perfect. Yeah. Well, going on to the arrangements on the quest, I I, I do think they're really excellent, and I said that in my. In well, my thank episode you. That I we really did. appreciate that. So. Yeah, that we did about this. And just as you've said, I, I think they're not overbearing, but I think they do add a sort of special depth and character to, to the music. So what conversations were there about the approach that you took with the band and how much were they involved, I mean, particularly Steve Howe, of course, in your part of the process? Well, really, uh, Steve, uh, in his role as producer, yeah, he mentioned it for for quite some time that there might be the possibility of orchestral arrangements but but when it came down to it i heard a very very early version of dare to know and then uh, uh, there was a section he said look the band stop here and here they start again you need to do something between (laughs) between that bit and that bit and it's 16 bars and it it, you know go away and do something it wasn't quite like that but um (laughs) he left me to my own devices and the first thing i did he loved it and that was that so um which from a composer's point of view is uh you know pretty wonderful Mm. Yeah. So there are some really interesting photos online from the orchestral recording sessions. I'm guessing you had to do that remotely. Is that correct? Uh, we did. In fact, it was it was really enjoyable, actually, uh, because the conductor, Oleg Kondratenko in, uh, in Skopje in North Macedonia, uh, he was he's brilliant and uh, is a, a violinist and conductor. And it was in safe hands. They're a very, very, very experienced orchestra. And um, it was great. So I had a live uh, feed from them uh, and a Skype link to talk directly to the conductor. Mm. And they did, it was three passes of everything. Two, you know, to do the same thing twice and then a third one for safety. They were great. They just rattled through it. I mean, they were... Well, what I, I like about about the footage, of, I watched the footage of the time... Uh, recording sessions and I've seen the photographs of, of the quest and it, it reminded me very much of magnification now when the band took the symphonic tour out with orchestra back in yes. 2001 wasn't it 2000 2001 yeah. yeah they in Europe they had a young orchestra and I, I think that gave gave a real youthful exuberance to those performances yeah, it was, now it was great I didn't see the North American ones but w- what's What's your experience of, how can I put it, um, stereotypically somewhat stuffy, uh, <laughs> well-established, uh, very old orchestras or, or session musicians or players or whatever, compared with people with a bit more youth? Uh, is that very unfair of me? Um, yes, <laughs> it is, because... The amazing thing about uh, players is that if you say to most orchestral players, OK, I'm going to give you 16 bars here of a, this is the chord pattern. I want you to improvise over it. Most of them would not know what to do, mm. really. I mean, mm. not know what to do yeah. at all and would sit there and not do anything rather yeah. than do something. Um, so the converse of that is also true. If the music is well written uh, very clear in its intentions, orchestral player of merit will be able to reproduce exactly what you mm. want, yeah. whether they're 16 or 70. Yeah. So, uh, and with all the verve and... So I would say the more mature players are, well, 
better in in some ways. I think it's funny if you, if you look at um, music programs and they have a string section on, mm. they usually can prize a very young good looking people <laughs> and that's the that's the image that you know that that pop is you know is this youthful vibrant yeah but i don't think vibrancy is the preserve of necessarily people who are under 30 <laughs> so <laughs> yay yeah. uh, so uh, i think with with orchestras sublime performances uh, can come yeah. from uh, people of all ages. All ages, I mean, literally. Yes, yes, absolutely. Well, just going back to, the, to your arrangements then, <laughs> on the quest for a moment, and we've always already mentioned uh, Dare to Know, which I think is, is great, the more extensive orchestration there, and I love the, the touches on Minus the Man as well. But for you, what was the, what was the song that you were particularly pleased with on the quest that you were involved with? I think there's a section in Leave Well Alone that I, I really like. Mm. And I thought I, the, the, there are bits of Minus the Man that I think I, I like them all, really, to be mm. honest. Mm. Mm. But the, the Lost Chord, there's a section at the end of that where Steve reprises the, the, the main line and the, the horns come in as answering him. And mm. I, I love, I really love, love that because mm. for me it has that... And I, I did try and look, you know, do some look at some of the reviews that, that, that whether the cinematic quality yeah. that certainly I was after yeah. uh, was, um, you know, people felt that that that, that had been achieved. Yes. Because I'm for me, I presented Steve with a version of And You and I, which was way back when uh as a right. potential thing, because I'm really into spoken word and music. I, yes. I love uh, the human voice uh, mixed with music. And I l love the lyrics to Andy and I. And I, mm. I said, well, you, we could do it so that it's a, a very gentle orchestral beginning, uh, building to something magnificent and, and great, yeah. as you'd expect. Uh, yeah. But that the words could be spoken at the beginning. Right. But he wasn't into it at all. <laughs> uh, it's not, I don't think that particular uh, juxtaposition of words and music with that particular song was, was his thing. But yeah. I, I'd still love to do it at some point <laughs> because that's a particularly, uh, again, a wonderful chord sequence in the yes. little instrumental section. Yes. So are you involved in any other rock band collaborations or would you like to be? Uh, no and yes. <laughs> um no uh not no no i'm not um and yes i I'd, I'd love to do that my most recent project has been to uh write a musical work to honor the healthcare workers in the national health service in the uk who, yeah. who have died uh from covid yeah so that was a british medical association commission so i've, I've just finished that yeah. I should share that with you, actually. Yeah, great. Um, That'd be great. But that's been a, a wonderful, again, an experience, and it reintroduced me back with the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra and uh, choirs and soloists. So that, that's been a, a wonderful experience. But no, I, I, I'm just waiting for the telephone to ring mm -hmm. <laughs> or, a, or an email to pop through. Yeah. yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. 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 But, but it is the, what, the, the amazing thing about the music business that... Music has a very, very wide reach, especially now that uh, with uh, social media and what have you, and that you never know who, who's listening and what um, collaborations uh, are possible. If we wanted to get a feel for your style of composition, where would we start? Crikey. <laughs> uh, well, uh, in terms of melody, I would say my my album, uh, again with the RPO, The, the Snow Queen, mm. Uh, which yeah. is uh, 2004. Yeah. Uh, which, again, I, I really, really put everything into. Um, but I did a, an album more recently with uh, the actor Michael Sheen, mm. uh, where he narrates the poems of a seven year old boy, which I, I have then set to music. Yes. Um, and that's called uh, Celestial. So that was, uh, that's a very, um, that's, that's a nice, a nice album. Uh, yeah. I would say that, wouldn't I, really? But, uh, <laughs> it, it is, it is. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, listen, we will put links to all that that we've talked about um, of your output 
it's been fascinating getting a little glimpse uh, this yes. week into your process, into what you've done, into your, your views of, of yes, etc. So thank you very much indeed, Paul. We'd love to have you back on and talk more just generally about yes next time. I'd, I'd be very happy to. Kevin and Mark, it's been a, a real pleasure. And I don't get the opportunity to have these sorts of conversations very often. So uh, and to talk about, you know, a band that have meant so much to me o- over the years. Great. Well, it's been a yeah, pleasure. Absolute pleasure. And I look forward to speaking to you again next time. Okay.